thank you for coming, and welcome to the Free Speech Movement Cafe Educational Program Series. I'm Melissa Martin, co-chair with my colleague Shannon, um, and we're uh, uh, members of the Free Speech Movement Educational Programs Committee. The FSM Educational Program at UC Berkeley Library is designed to engage the campus community with issues related to the free speech movement and the wide range of activities the movement helped to inspire, including free speech activism and social change. Our committee is made up of a group of library staff who are dedicated to free speech, and this time I'll ask committee members to raise their hands. <laughs> so if you have any questions um, after the talk, you're welcome to just grab one of us and we'd, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, we welcome student groups and others to submit applications for programs to be held in the Free Speech Movement Cafe. And information about that is on our uh, website. <laughs> and, and so for tonight, we have an incredibly distinguished panel, as you can see. Um, we're going to give the uh, mic over to Audrey Cassenti, who is the chair of the Berkeley chapter of the Platypus Affiliated Society, and she's gonna introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming out. This is a great showing. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research and journalism, focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old, 1920s through the 30s, new, 1960s through the 70s, and post-political, 1980s through the 90s, left, for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Uh, I, just a brief note on me, I study political theory, and as uh, Shannon said, I lead the Berkeley chapter of the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, we have M Max Elbaum here today, very excited. Max has been involved in peace, anti-racist, and radical movements since joining Students for a Democratic Society, otherwise known as SDS, in Madison, Wisconsin in the 1960s. He's currently an editor of Organizing Upgrade and the author of Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao, and Che, a history of the US new communist movement recently re-released by Verso Books. And that's actually available on the front table over there and tonight, it is $15 instead of $20. So look out for that. Uh, next we have Watson Ladd uh, sitting next to him. Watson is a recent Berkeley grad school alumnus and a member of the Platypus Affiliate Society. He's also involved in housing activism at the local level. And last we have our honored guest, Bobby Seal. Of course, everyone is an honored guest tonight, but of course we have Bobby Seal uh, who's one of the major historical protagonists of the New Left, as the co-founder of the Black Panther Party in 1966 with Huey Newton, as well as a lifelong activist promoting education for at-risk inner-city youth, community control of the police, and a number of other issues throughout his long and very accomplished life. Please give a warm round of applause for all the players. Warm welcome, warm round of applause, same thing, I think. Uh, tonight, the topic in honor of the semi-centennial anniversary of 1968, 50 years of 1968. Um, I'm gonna read the prompt and then go over the format and then we'll just jump right into it. For half a century, 1968 has represented the high water mark of social and political transformation, a year of social upheaval that spanned the entire globe ushered in by a new left that sought to distinguish itself from the old left that emerged in the 1920s and 30s, the monumental events of 1968 set the tone for everything from protest politics to active academic leftism. Today, with the US entangled in a seemingly endless war in Asia and people calling for the impeachment of an unpopular, excuse me, of an unpopular president, with activists fighting in the streets and calling for liberation along the lines of race, gender, and sexuality, the left's every attempt to discover new methods and new ideas seems to invoke a memory of the political horizons of 1968. 
What lessons are to be drawn from the new left as another generation undertakes the project of building a left for the 21st century? And the format is as follows. Each speaker will present for approximately 10 to 12 minutes, followed by a brief response period between the panelists before we open it up for questions from the audience. And a note to you all, once you get down to the last two minutes, I'm gonna do a little wave, just to warn you. Uh, without further ado, I think we should jump right in. We're gonna go in the order that everyone's seating. So we're gonna start with Max, Max Album. Okay, how's this? Yeah. All right, great. So, 1968 was full of remarkable events that transformed global politics and U.S. politics. Just as far as the United States, the police rioted at the Democratic Convention in 1968, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the election of Richard Nixon, Tommy Smith and John Carlos giving the Black Power salute at the 1968 Olympics, one of the iconic images of the 1960s. And just two weeks before that, the police in Mexico City massacring 300 student protesters. But there were two events in particular that stood out that affected US politics more than the others. The Tet Offensive in Vietnam and the assassination of Martin Luther King. In 1967, fall 1967, General William Westmoreland, who was the commander of US troops in Vietnam, announced to the world that the United States was on the verge of victory in Vietnam. It was the beginning of the end. January 30th, 1968, the National Liberation Front of Vietnam launched simultaneous attacks on 120 cities. They penetrated into the US Embassy in Saigon they held the second largest city in Vietnam, the imperial capital of Hue, for 30 days. The attack came as a complete surprise to the U.S. military high command. It was a turning point in the war. It led directly to Lyndon Johnson stepping down from running from re-election. On March 31, 1968, Johnson said he would not seek or accept his party's nomination for the presidency and open up peace talks with the Vietnamese. That was the signal that no matter how long it took, the United States was gonna lose the war. Four days after Johnson withdrew from the presidential race, Martin Luther King was assassinated. King's murder sent off nationwide rebellions in over 100 cities. They had to mount machine guns on the Capitol roof and the White House roof. 2,500 people were injured, many were killed. They had to call up 70,000 federal troops in order to restore order. It's not a surprise that those two events were the seminal pivots and had the most impact in the 1960s, partly because they were so stunning in themselves, but also because they manifested the underlying structures and relationships in US society. The intertwined relationships of race and racism on the one hand and empire building and war on the other hand. This is a country that was founded on the genocide of the native population and the enslavement of people of African descent. Black labor built, was the main labor force that built and created not only the edifice of US capitalism, but global Western capitalism. And race and racism have been at the pivot of the sharpest polarizations in US society since the 1600s, the Civil War, in the 60s, and that's what we see today. All that bubbled to the surface, surface in the rawest of ways in 1968. For tens of thousands of people, for thousands who had participated in the protests from the beginning of the civil rights movement in 1955 through 1968, King's murder 
convince tens of thousands that the U.S. system could not be reformed, that in order to bring about a world of peace and equality, some kind of social revolution was necessary. And the Tet Offensive was the main springboard convincing people that revolution was not only necessary, but it was possible. Now, you know, today in our consciousness, the idea that the United States doesn't win the wars it fights, that's common sense. Everybody sees that. But you have to put yourself in the place of 1968. Those of us in that generation have been taught not only that the US was a democracy, the best country in the world and all that, but that it was invincible. It had never lost the war. So the earthquake in our consciousness when the Vietnamese were going to win that war. And it was punctuated by the uprising in France in 1968 when 10 million workers on strike and students on the barricades almost overthrew a government in the heart of Western Europe. It was punctuated the whole third, what we call the third world, was alive with national liberation movements. And it was part of our own consciousness from our own direct experience. Those of us who had protested the war, on March 31st, 1968, we felt we had taken part in overthrowing the President of the United States, and not through the cruel means of assassination, like Kennedy was assassinated and so on, but through mass collective political action. It's very heady stuff for people in their 20s. And there were revolutionary organizations around to inspire us and move us chief among them in 1968, the Black Panther Party. And it's an honor to be on the same podium with Bobby Seale, co-founder of that visionary and pioneering organization. So even amid all the horrors of the 1960s, the assassinations, the genocide in Vietnam, the violence against civil rights protesters, we thought revolution was not just needed, but actually possible. We saw ourselves as part of a global surge led by what Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth, but it embraced everybody who had a conscience. Anybody who took part was valued and had a contribution to make. Being imprinted with that kind of thinking when you're a late teenager or in your early 20s, it changes your life. It caused so many people from that generation to make a lifelong commitment to participating in movements for social change and it gave us the gift of hope, and it shows us how, showed us how to identify with people all over the globe, even people who were very different from ourselves. Translating that, though, into practical politics is another matter. It's complicated, it's messy, it's difficult. It needs more than good intentions, commitment, and insight into the fact that the system needs to be overthrown. You know, it's one thing to grow up in a time when there's music in the cafes at night and revolution in the air. That's from Bob Dylan, Tangled Up in Blue. That's where I got the title of my book. It's one thing to grow up in that kind of time. It's another thing to produce a durable revolutionary movement on the ground. Uh, my generation of radicals tried to do that. We grappled with that through the 70s and 80s. We tried to build roots in communities of color. We organized among workers. We tried to take up every fight against sexism, homophobia, the kinds of backlashes that started to emerge in the late 1960s. We made contributions to some important fights, but we made a lot of mistakes. Our, we assessed the period. We thought there was going to be new upsurges not that long after the 60s. They would be more radical, more rooted in the working class, and more to the left. That didn't work out that way. We built our organizations and our movements on that kind of anticipation, but history went another way. The ruling class was able to regroup, very skillful campaign using racism, sexism, anti-feminism, homophobia to divide the working class and launch a successful counterattack against the gains in the 1960s. Uh, so capitalism was in fact restructured after the gains of the 1960s but not in a progressive direction. Instead, we got Reaganism and what today is usually called neoliberalism. So we learned a bunch. Uh, many of us who went through that are proud of what we did and the contributions we made, but we have to face up to the fact that we failed at our project 
of the, we, building a U.S. durable revolutionary movement that could sustain itself year after year. My book is a history of one important strand of the post-1960s movements. Every section of the left grew at that time, but the section that grew the most were those people who turned to third world oriented versions of Marxism and built what was called the New Communist Movement. For a period of time, it was the most dynamic sector of the US left. It attracted a plurality of people, particularly from the freedom movements of the communities of color. Uh, and it had a measure of dynamism through the 70s. My book traces the work of that movement and offers some balance sheet of what went right, what went wrong, why we made the decisions that we did. It's an offer for people to take what you like from that history and leave the rest. Uh, two minutes? Two minutes, perfect. So now we're facing Donald Trump. It's the epitome of the backlash that's been building over the last 40 years. He built on Nixon's Southern strategy, used dog whistle racism to spearhead the backlash against progressive movements. The dog whistles are gone now. It's naked, blatant, shameless racism. And after the Kavanaugh hearings, no one can underestimate the impact of the misogyny and the shameless efforts by people who are ruling the world to talk about themselves as white male with, with grievances. They're the victims. Nothing is more dangerous than the people in power seeing themselves as victims. Uh, the combination, though, of Trump's election and Bernie's campaign and the movements Black Lives Matter, Alicia, who wrote the forward to my uh, book, is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, it's put the question of political power back on the agenda for the first time, really, since the 1960s. The left did a lot of things over the 70s and 80s, but didn't address the question of a path to power. Now everyone's talking about a path to power. It's different than the 60s. The electoral arena, for example, is much more prominent. Social media has changed. All kinds of things have changed. But the patterns from the 60s that are relevant, it's a question of power. It's a question of the system. It's important to assess where you are because there's no straight shot to revolution. You have to have intermediate goals along the way of what can be accomplished at a particular moment. I think we'll get into this more in the discussion. And the very last thing is, Tom Hayden used to say, he was a leader of SDS in the 60s, change happens slowly, except when it happens fast. And the fact is, when millions of people rise up and work together, they can make change, and they can make change happen fast. That's the gift of hope we got in the 1960s, especially for the civil rights, black power movement, and the movements in the third world. And it's the gift of hope that we tried, my generation has tried to convey and pass on to your generation as you pick up the torch. Thanks. I am in the position of reflecting on events 23 years before my birth between two people who not only witnessed these events, but participated in them. I'm by no means an expert on the history, let alone in its global dimensions, which have really not been touched on, but are certainly important. I'm certainly offering no doxa, but rather reflections, perhaps less formed than they should be. Uh, there's certainly an unfortunate amount of familiarity with the history of the left that I'm assuming in my remarks. And if they are mysterious, please ask about, about what is mysterious in the questions. So let me describe the impact that I see it today. And the way I see it today is 1968 is not the high watermark of political and social transformation, but rather the potentiality of that transformation. Neoliberalism, whether we take the date as 1976 when Carter was elected, or under Thatcher a little bit later in England, is a much more lasting and enduring social change. 1968 was a squandered opportunity. And 1973's impact shows that, was an op another op shows that 1973 was another opportunity, but this time seized by the right, not the left. Although we can quibble about neoliberalism for various reasons I don't want to get into. What do I mean by this? Certainly there's a lot in the 60s which is radical, which is transformational, 
but I don't believe that when we talk about 68 is what we mean. Decriminalization of homosexuality, the civil rights movement, uh, the, passage, the access of women to birth control, the forced liberalization, obscenity law reform, all of these are not a product of the global youth revolution. They are a much more institutionally supported transformation. Uh, if you look at the history, especially of homosexuality being decriminalized, it is the model penal code in the 19, 1965. It is not a result of Stonewall. And in England, we have the House, you know, this famous quote about the House of Lords, which is instrumental in the decriminalization. Um, so 1968, when I'm talking about 1968, I'm talking about the moment of global revolt. I'm talking about the potentiality of global revolution. I don't think it achieved, well, I don't think it was, it was aimed at something deeper. It was aimed at revolution, and it failed to do so. There might have been a possibility of a global anti-capitalist, a global socialist revolution, and that did not happen. The 1968 moment is against the welfare state. It is not in support of the welfare state. It's against the welfare state because the welfare state was repressive. If you were on welfare, for instance, people would go inspect your home. Your family life was controlled by the needs of welfare programs. And then, shortly afterwards, there's a fight against neoliberalism in favor of that welfare state, which only a few years earlier was being overcome. And then now we have a fight against neolib in favor of neoliberalism against Trump. Now, Trump's sick, but he's new. And so there is a moment here, too. The left is no longer in the driver's seat of history. We live in counter-revolution. We live in regression. We live in barbarism. And we've been living that way ever since 1917. What we're left with in 2011 with the Occupy moment, or in 2003 with the Iraq war protests, or today's labor movement, or the Fight for 15, which recently achieved gains in Berkeley and Seattle, is an echo of the politics of the 60s. And I think if you reflect on Maxwell Bond from Marx, you'll see that what we see here today is very similar. The questions of the 60s remain with us. But because we live in a fundamentally different world politically, we, the analysis I don't think applies now. And the analysis of the present on which today's political activities need to be based doesn't exist. And so we're stuck with the same feudal kinds of organizing, the same feudal kinds of marches. This is a legacy of misleadership because the 1960 generation also was betrayed. It's betrayed because there's an absent moment of the old left, which was destroyed. There's a gap between the 30s and the 60s, and that gap is a massive problem for revolution. It's why there has to be a rediscovery in the 70s. Today's intellectual landscape, beyond the strictly political, is also a legacy of 1968. Foucault, Lacan, postmodern enterprise, these are in. The entire Enlightenment tradition, starting with Hobbes, ending with Adorno, going through Marx, Engels, Trotsky, Lenin, these are Enlightenment figures. That's an object of suspicion. Marx is an Enlightenment thinker. He is the continuation of the Enlightenment project through Kant, through Hegel, and Kant and Hegel are carrying out the project of Locke, and Locke is ultimately, there is a continu continuity here. But now we think of these figures as conservative, Marx included. And so there's very few people to, alive today who have taken the time to study Marxism and to study the Frankfurt School because of this abandonment. And it's confused our reception. Our preconceptions of these thinkers come in part from the way we do 68. Adolf Reed recently wrote an article, which I can't really summarize in time a lot, I don't think I can do it justice, calling anti-racism the neoliberal alternative to a left. I highly recommend that article. I think it poses important questions to think about. And I think we should consider carefully in the discussion of the present, and he mentions that we consider in the discussions of the present that the same dynamics are at work that were in the past. And this impedes our clarity in political action. Hillary Clinton will never 
never seize the means of production. But she can insist that Confederate memorials be destroyed. She can insist that we defend affirmative action. The Democratic Party can defend all these things, and that's a sign that they ultimately aren't forcing politics. In 1968, ending the Vietnam War meant breaking the Democratic Party. In the Civil Rights Movement, calling for representation of, black, of blacks in the South meant pressuring the Democratic Party and ultimately raising the, prob the possibility of a split with them. And today, there is no horizon for right action. The DSA capitulates to the Democratic Party every time it endorses a Democratic candidate. It does not have an independent electoral presence. And what does all this demonstrate? What it demonstrates is that we live in a time of what the Frankfurt School called regression. What was possible, a generation was imaginable a generation ago, imaginable two generations ago, imaginable over a century ago, is steadily shrunk. In 1917, you have revolution in Germany, which is crushed. You have the possibility that a leading capitalist state be taken over by socialists. Does anyone think that we have that possibility now? And just this morning I was at a protest at a homeless encampment. And there is not a question of building millions of homes for the working class in America with government money. There is only the most tepid attempts to house people in the most dire needs. So there's a real shrinking here. What do I propose to solve it? Well, I don't have the answers, but I think what we need to do is we need to forget the 60s. And we need to forget the 60s in that because if we look, if, I think if we re-examine Marx, if we re-examine the, some of the, the key figures before the 60s, the sort of revolutionary tradition before then, we will see that they answer the questions that face us today I don't think this means repeating their, the same positions they had. I think it means re repeating their analysis and looking at our present to figure out what the political actions are today. And so what I'm suggesting is just as what I consider to be one of the first revolutions in the Western world, we have to begin by going back to the sources and forgetting the accumulated wisdom. Thank you. Right on. It's spot like a balmy breeze on a night in May, like a cool mint julep on a summery day. The 1960s protest movement, and in 1968, was a year that my organization grew like leaps and bounds across America. The Black Panther Party wasn't found on the basis of socialism. Uh, I had never read any socialism. I didn't even know any socialism. Uh, I did know about the Berkeley Co-op, you know, so when I did well, write something about cooperatives in one point of the 10 point platform of program, it was about the Berkeley Co-op. I was a member of it, but I was not aware that the Berkeley Co-op was a socialist type organization. I'm trying to tell you, I was distant from that. Uh, the only thing I knew about communism and socialism was uh, uh, the, what is it, 1950s. A guy named Richard Carlson was starting a thing called I Was a Communist for the FBI or something like that on television. I was a teenager or something, you know. Um, Actually, I come from a high-tech world. I evolved to a high-tech world, you know. Uh, I was a carpenter and a builder and an architect at age 15 and 16 and stuff like that with my father. My uh, grandfather and uncles and stuff were carpenters and builders in the 20s and the 30s, what have you. Uh, my father built our first home in Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, himself, uh, 
we built our first home in Port Arthur, Texas, when I turned seven and a half years of age. So by the time we moved to California because of wartime jobs, I'm eight years of age and I get off the Santa Fe train at the Berkeley train station there at university next to the Bur Burbank Junior High. I didn't know that was Burbank Junior High. I mean, I just got to the joint, you know, but that's where I come from. I mean, I lived in the uh, Cordonese's Village, which later today became uh, what, the University Village or something, in Berk on the Berkeley side. So I was raised up in Berkeley, Burbank Junior High and Berkeley High School. It's where I come from. And I guess what happened to the Air Force, I wound up choosing to go to Rapid City, South Dakota. Because at age 15 and 16, I had identified with the uh, Lakota Nation, Native Americans. Uh, Lakota, of course, and you know, is the so-called Sioux. The Sioux, you know, the word Sioux is a French word, you know, it means cutthroat. The real true name of the Native Americans is the Lakota. You have to watch Dances with Wolves and you'll see. <laughs> they make reference to that. I'm just saying that I chose the base, even though I was an honor student in my tech school in Amarillo Air Force Base, et cetera, um, and I could have chose other bases all across the world. Because I had identified with the Lakota, I chose Rapid City, South Dakota as an Ellsworth Air Force Base, a strategic air command base, where we had B-52 B bombers. So there I was evolving through that process, four years United States Air Force out and um, really nothing, was not involved in anybody's politics until I landed the job at Kaiser Aerospace Electronics on Doolittle Drive in San Leandro, just outside of Oakland, and wound up working on the Gemini missile program and engineering department out there. And halfway between that, part-time at Merritt College as an engineering design major, I began to study and research my African and African American people's history. And it was something, you know, I was getting into. I knew about Native American history. I knew about the Lakota peoples, etc. I mean, I knew the history of that, but I knew, I did not know black and black American history or nothing. You know, I got A's in math but I knew nothing about the history. But that's what happened. And uh, right between that, I guess I went to hear Martin Luther King speak in uh, 1963, uh, a little bit before he, uh, 64, before he got the Civil Rights Bill passed. Um, and then that, I had to, went to hear him speak at the Oakland Auditorium, and I'm just one person. It's six and a half thousand people in that auditorium. And Dr. King was talking and speaking about the discrimination, et cetera, and so on, and got into the whole problem of the economics of lack of jobs and black folks first fired, last, last hired and first fired. And he went on about all these industries and companies across the country that wouldn't hire any people of color. And he got back, he was here in the Bay Area, so he says, right here in the uh, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Langendorf Bread Company and Kilpatrick's Bread Company would not hire any people of color. He says, and all across America, the way he put it, Wonder Bread Company would not hire any people of color. And you know, this oratory this brother has, you know. He says, and here we're gonna have to boycott him. And I wanna boycott him so consistent and so profoundly, we wanna make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. <laughs> and he excited that whole audience, that 6,000 audience in there, and me. I'm just an individual, I have no organization or nothing. I'm just studying my history and being inspired. And that was the pivot point. 
that was literally the pivot point that I got off into my black American history. Uh, when the civil rights bill passed, I quit my job to work in the grassroots community and start, I created a first program, helped create a program with, with five other students, three black students and three white students. We worked together. Uh, we put together a uh, tutorial program in North Richmond, California. Uh, the whole structure of it, we did it, you know. Uh, that's the first thing I did. And this is two years before the Black Panther Party was ever even conceived of. At any rate, a year or so later, I'm working for the city government of Oakland, California. And that is when uh, I uh, begin to understand that when they put this book out, Black Power, you know, uh, I mean, I've read quite a lot of other materials too by this time and digest and stuff. Everything from Frank Renone's Wretched of the Earth to W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, what have you, etc. I, um, I, I, to, to me, I had to, I had to do something, you know, to change this situation. See, I was a lucky guy to be raised up a carpenter, a builder, doing architecture, lot plot layouts, with add rooms and dens for my father and his contracting brother and stuff like that. And that my stuff passed license inspection, you know. I mean, boom, I studied the building codes, what have you, et cetera. And I'm 15, 16 years of age. So to be raised that way with skills and abilities and to walk into the Air Force and master in the, in, in the airframe structure repair, all the skill level test levels, you know, and I'm still a corporal. And uh, to the point, you know, that, that was where I was at, that I excel in that stuff. And then I come out and begin to work and I begin to get interested. As I got interested in the struggle and what it was and what it was about. I mean, I looked up one day in trying to study Africa and found this guy, Kwame Nkrumah, had a smelting plant for bauxite, you know? Well, I knew what that was worth. I had a little, quite a bit of metallurgical knowledge. And even when I was putting black history in, in, um, in uh, Merritt College, I was reading something and I says, bauxite. I said, they got bauxite over there. And everybody looked at me, what the hell is bauxite? <laughs> I said, man, that's the basic aluminum or all aluminum products in the world. Africans should be rich as a motherfucker, man. God damn. Can you imagine all the billions of aluminum? Two minutes? <laughs> anyway, my point is this here. I got off into this and created the Black Panther Party because I wanted to organize a political electoral machine. Working for the city government of Oakland in 65 and 66, I did a demographic search that across America. There were only, in 1965, when that book came out, Black Power, 55 black folks, people of color, duly elected to political office, anywhere in the United States of America all across the United States of America. This is what I found out. So the idea of going out and patrolling the police was to capture the imagination of the people, and as I told Huey, so I can organize a political electoral machine because we ain't gonna have no power until we take over some political power seats. This is what I believe. I said we need some city council seats, we need some county supervisorial seats. These guys manage multi, multi billion, millions of dollars we don't get an equity fair share distribution relationship to the taxes, et cetera, and so on. And that's what we were. So we went out to patrol the police, but we researched every law, et cetera, boom, 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 boom. We took guns with us because in Los Angeles, there had been a group a year before that that called themselves CAP, Community Alert Patrol in Los Angeles. And all they had was law books and tape recorders and walkie-talkies and flashlights. And they would stand and watch the police for a month after they watched rides. And the next thing you know, they all got beat up 
and tape recorders and walkie-talkies smashed up, drug downtown, Los Angeles jail, and locked up. That was a year before we created the Black Panther Party, October 66. And what we did is we went out, I organized the people, taught them safety with guns and all this other kind of stuff, knew all the laws of the guns, and we're gonna observe the police as a means to capture the imagination of the people so I could organize a political electoral machine. That's what this was about. I mean, you gotta imagine, I what I got, 14, 15, 16 people in the whole damn party at the time. Well, maybe 17 because big man Evan Howard, he couldn't come because he had a full-time job and had 12 credit hours at Merrick. My point is, when we got there that night in the red light district of West Oakland, and we did our research, we knew where we was at, and the cop says, you have no right to observe me. And we says, no, California State Supreme Court rules states that every citizen has the right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance in that particular room is constituted as eight to 10 feet. We'll observe and we'll observe you whether you like it or not. And some sister in the back of the crowd, she said, well, go ahead on and tell it. Say it again, <laughs> say it again. <laughs> And the cop says, is that gun loaded? Huey says, if I know it's loaded, that's good enough. Well, I have a right. Huey says, no, you don't. Huey cited something, the United States Supreme Court, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, you cannot remove my property from it without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And a tall black guy over there, man, he's scratching his head. He said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> and I'm trying to tell you, it just happened that way. I mean, I disciplined them. You know, I've been in the military. I knew how to hold weapons, how to find a point. See, we had every law down. I mean, down to the point that we knew you couldn't ride in the car with a live round in the chamber of a rifle or shotgun. Did not apply to a handgun. You see what I'm getting? We had all of that down. So my whole point when I told Huey, research and do that, we're not going to go out here naked. We're going to know the law, et cetera. In other words, that kicked everything off when I look my little handful of members. But it was not till the next year that Martin Luther King in 1968 was murdered. But I formed a coalition with Dr. Martin Luther King five weeks before he was murdered. We had already formed a coalition in late October with the anti-war draft movement and then also the Peace and Freedom Party. And uh, it was all connected with the politics, you know, the voter registration and all this kind of stuff and the rallies and so on. That's what it's about. And that's where I was coming from. And then I created those programs. But more importantly, Dr. King asked me, through Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy, asked me, would the Black Panther Party be willing to work with Dr. King for his upcoming Poor People's March and work with a round table some 110 organizational groups that Martin Luther King had identified across America in these black community areas, okay? And that we were on the West Coast. I had no chapters and no branches across the country with the Black Panther Party. I only had 400 members up, up and down the West Coast at this time. And in effect, what happens is that I told Dr. King, yes, we will work with you however you want to, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. And they killed Dr. King. And from the April 4th to the day Nixon was elected that year, my organization swelled from 400 members up and down the West Coast to 5,000 members and 49 chapters and branches. And I went to practice every last one of those chapters to teach my party members the grassroots community organizing based on some basic dialectical principles. And uh, that's what I did. And I uh, began to identify uh, councilmatic districts, supervisorial seats and stuff like this here, et cetera, and so on. And boom, and this is when Nixon got elected, November. I have 5,000 members. Yeah, half of them were Rally Panthers, but there was a value to Rally Panthers. These were the people who couldn't come and work full time. They had jobs, what have you, et cetera. But when it came down to 
organize an election or putting something down, you know. Like we put community control of police on the ballot right here in Berkeley, California. Community control of police. But at that time, the Nixon administration says, why is this organization still existing? It says we got Huey in jail, we got Eldridge in exile, and somebody says that goddamn Bobby Seal, he's the one doing this damn shit. Anyway, they arrested me and put me in jail. <laughs> Well, whatever, all kinds of dumb charges. Anyway, let's go to the Q&A. Thank you. One round of applause for all of the panelists tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so we're gonna do the brief response period between the panelists. So I just ask that you keep it to like a couple of minutes, uh, if possible. I know, it's, I know it's difficult. This is an insanely loaded topic. Um, but just do a couple uh, minute remarks to one another. You can respond to whatever um, aspect of each other's presentations you choose. And then we're gonna open it up for Q&A with the audience. Hopefully we'll have about a half an hour to 45 minutes for that. That's what uh, we're slated for. So any one of you want to respond to one another's panel, I'll just pass you the mic right now. Not all at once. <laughs> I'll say something. Uh, <laughs> Well, the issue got raised about Marxism. Um, <clears throat> Marx never talked about Marxism. He talked about the materialist conception of history. And the two key terms in there are materialist and history. And I think what was, has been taken to be meant by that is you need the materialism side tries to look at the social forces and what's possible at any given time is based on a combination of the objective conditions and the social forces, and then the uh, conscious elements, the radicals and other political forces can affect that, but it's within the constraints of the objective conditions of the time. And assessing the history of the left, not just the 60s, but going back uh, through the whole left, you need to, um, I mean, we need to be ruthlessly critical and self-critical, but the criteria has to be what was possible at a given moment. We don't judge the revolutionaries in the Civil War for failing to uh, make a socialist revolution because that wasn't on the historical agenda. Uh, and I think uh, we need to try to take a look at the social forces. And if you look at US history, the US ruling class uh, built itself as the most powerful ruling class in the world. Uh, it's been dented, it's been hit, but it's never, uh, we've never come close to a revolutionary situation in the United States. There's been revolutionary movements and there have been revolutionary ideas and there have certainly been people advocating revolution, but uh, the, the classic formulation is that a revolutionary situation is when the masses can't live in the old way, the ruling class can't rule in the old way, and there's a nationwide crisis that draws everyone in the society into politics. And that's never happened in the United States. So we need to be self-critical about the left, but we have to look at what was possible at any given moment. And uh, to me, if you look back, the most important pattern in US history has been that every time there's been a leap forward, there's been a backlash. And the ruling class has been able uh, to dominate that backlash because of its technological, political reserves, and essentially because of white supremacy. The rollback reconstruction was the most progressive governments ever to exist. I mean, that's what gave us public education that was the first voting rights. That was the end to incarceration at the time. And it was rolled back through Klan terror and disenfranchisement of African Americans. In the 1930s, the upsurge there among the workers was rolled back by the Cold War and McCarthyism. And the 1960s backlash we're living through now. So it's a combination of leaps and you get pushed back. And uh, my generation made an incredible number of mistakes in the 70s in terms of assessing the relative weight of that backlash. I mean, my book is one big self-criticism about what we did wrong. But I don't think it was that we 
uh, were unable to make revolution, that wasn't on the agenda. But we were unable to build the kind of left that we carried forward. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, I, I really don't think that, I mean, the words like betrayal, squandered, capitulation, that, that's actually not that helpful in politics. That's not usually how mistakes get made in social forces. Uh, there's people who do those things, but I don't think it's the right lens to judge the relationship between conditions and the activities of the conscious elements. It, it leads in a direction that's more paralyzing and more uh, uh, attributing psychological and individual failures and things like that, as opposed to looking at the social forces, which uh, Marx said, concrete analysis of concrete conditions is the living soul of Marxism. So I'm sure Watson has a response to that. <laughs> I think there is certainly a question of whether or not, and I think I, I tried to leave this open in my remarks, of whether or not revolution was possible. And certainly I think if we look internationally, there's the question of France, where the government was toppled. There were very significant questions about, French, about the French government's continuity in 68. There's also the question of Czechoslovakia. And Czechoslovakia is perhaps the more problematic case because it really forces us to grapple again with questions of Stalinism. Uh, I, I certainly think it's possible that there was no re really revolutionary moment, but that raises the question of transformations in American society that would happen after that. Why is it that the, that the, the transformations that neoliberalism creates and the economic paralysis, the economic crisis that leads to the enactment of those changes, why is that not a moment where the, which the left could take advantage of? And certainly there are changes there that, that could potentially have become deeper. The other thing is, sitting where we are now, I was very struck, sort of, I don't think the language, and the way we think about politics today is, has come from that 1968 moment. And if it's true that we don't have a left today that could take advantage of a revolutionary moment were one to present itself, a moment where the objective conditions were such that you could have a revolution, then we have to really reevaluate why. And so I think the question has to be open again. And I think that in order to really answer that, we do need a reanalysis. And that reanalysis has, has to th throw out all the old dogmas, all the old thought taboos, and start from fresh. Interesting. When 68 did roll around, uh, this is when Marxist Leninism came into the Black Panther Party. Now, Ray Masai Hewitt comes from Los Angeles. I think he knew uh, others down there but he was associating himself with Munchie Carter's organization called The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, Munchie Carter had been in prison with uh, Eldridge Cleaver for five years. They're both from Los Angeles. And he come out of prison with a lot more consciousness than when he went in. Munchie Carter ran the biggest gang, I think 3,000 members strong, the Solosans in Los Angeles, California. And he came out. Now, to me, what Bunchy represented was the lump in proletariat that I found out about in those early days in uh, the wretched of the uh, the, uh, the wretched of the earth with uh, France Fanon. You see, so and so even when I started the Black Panther Party, one idea besides patrol the police was to get what I used to call brothers off the block, you know, and educate them and politically educate them to be political revolutionaries. I mean, the ones who got the, the guts and the audacity, but I like to call it the stupidity, to go out and, and stick up a bank or a robber. You see what I mean? You gotta politically educate this brother and, and, and put that person. And I got that really from 
uh, Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a street hustler, a little lumpy proletariat, blah, 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 etc. what have you. But he transformed, although he was in the Nation of Islam. And me, you know, I, their ideology, separate, the, 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 the whole separation analysis that the Nation of Islam talked about, it, it wasn't part of me. You know, okay, fine, yeah, you can do that, but I want to... I wanted political political seats. I, I really did, you know, because when we had that coalition with Peace and Freedom Party at one point, you know, we got in, thoroughly involved with them. Of course, all our rallies, because we was having rallies five thousand here, seven thousand here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and uh, that that was in the front. Now on the Marxist Lenin thing, I broke with it as it was growing and developing in my party. Uh, in those one, two, three months which, uh, after uh, uh, Martin Luther King was killed, etc. I'm always sort of arguing with, uh, with uh, Raymond Sa Hewitt. Now, he was well read in Martin. This guy digested Dos Capital and everything else, you know what I mean? Uh, but he was too doctrinaire. But I didn't know what doctrinairism was really till later with. So I got to Michael Harrington, you know what I mean? That was later in life. But my point is, at that point of its growth, et cetera, uh, and it was coming, and then I read up and found out about Stalin. I said, oh, I can't stand this guy, you know what I mean, blah, 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 blah. So for whatever reason, People's Park was around, what have you, and I was up supporting that group, et cetera, because we had coalition with all these left, white, left radicals, coalition with all the people of color organizations in the black, in the black, the Asian, and Chicano, Mexican, American, Latino communities. We had all of these coalitions. We had coalitions with 39 different organizational groups in the country, including Dr. King's SCLC and other organizations and groups, including the NAACP and so on. And they had resources to make, you know, more than, uh, more than, Different ideology, different other ideological arguments, uh, but that's when I somebody Raymond Sy Hewitt what put Stalin's picture up in our headquarters office in Berkeley. You know, it was over in Berkeley by this time. And I went said, "What you got doing, Stalin's fit?" Oh, everybody agrees. I said, "What do you mean?" So he went Eldridge. They, they're all part of my central committee. You got Eldridge to agree, Eldridge and Kaepernick to agree. You got Huey in jail to agree, you know, et cetera, and bunch of so people like declared who was on the central committee. You know, I, I, I'm the chairman of the Black Fund. Well, I, I would call me anyway. Boom, but he did this individually. And I said, so I said, I don't want that picture up there. Now. I had a lot of young Jewish kids, but an old Jewish guy used to come by, be in his house shoes, old people used to come by and buy a black man's party newspaper. You know what I mean? Like we'd all see him and dream. we liked this old guy, you know what I mean? He'd come by and he, uh, he said, oh, what the hell are you doing with that son of a gun? Get you up. <laughs> and I says, I'm trying to get it down. <laughs> I, I believe in democratic centralism. You know, I, I, I felt I voted already, but I got to get this damn picture down. When it so happened, the People's Park thing and the protest was going up here at the University of California, Berkeley, somewhere out there in somebody's house in the backyard, they had a nice backyard, they had an art sale. You know, somebody, several people did draw a lot of art. Thirty or forty pieces, and I went back there and said, you know, and these were the days Marlon Brando was donating big money to me. So you know, I, I'm a walking treasure. I, I have four or five thousand dollars in the pocket. Oh yeah, Marlon Brando came in right at the time, but he, he came and met me before Dr. King was killed. I'm telling you, and he says, "What can I do to help?" I says, "I need money and funds." I says, "What you need?" I said, "Well, I can use five thousand right now." Call his people up, wire me five thousand. Over a period of time, right? So now I got a financial backer, you know. So anyway, at, well, I guess what I'm getting. We're at this 
in the yard where this art was. And somebody had did an oil painting of Huey Newton. <laughs> and I says, wow. I says, how much is this? What is this? I says, I want to buy this. So the artist came out. The artist came out and he says, you, you can have it. I said, I can have it. I said, oh yeah. I says, look, I got to carry this. And he went and got some kind of velvet thing and put the painting in there and gave it to me. And then I says, okay, I'll call the Central Committee. I called a bunch of them up from Los Angeles and everybody up and each, each chapter branch and get your people down here, et cetera. So I had a crowd, 60, 70 people in, in the headquarters and there's Stalin pictures up there. So I says, all right, everybody, I'll call this meeting, blah, 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 concerning leadership in the Black Panther Party and symbols and what things we stand for and won't stand for. Now, who is the person who represents the party? You do, Chairman. I says, no, 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 yeah, 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 but Huey Newton is right now our top symbol, right, right. Do you want to have, I want a consensus from you, do you want to have Stalin's picture up here? And then I pull out the painting, or Huey Newton's picture up here. <laughs> and that's why I did that. And I got rid of Stalin's picture. <laughs> My point though, I'm, I'm, see, I, I understood at that time that The socialism that uh, Stalin represented in wartime, whatever, etc. I just didn't like this guy, and I didn't like the relationship of, of what he was coming. I hated Hitler at worst, and I'm glad he fought and, 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 and helped kick Hitler's ass. But my point is, the goal of the, my concept of, 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 of grounded socialism was revolved around my argument for greater community control. Literal community control. Greater community control of the people in the community, not only in terms of their voting rights, but programs and stuff in their very communities. This is the stuff. So one of the things I was doing at the same time this growth was going on, I went after programs. First, the breakfast program, and simultaneously the sick cell and even testing program. And a little bit after that, a month or so, I created the free preventative medical health care clinics, okay? We put real programs in the community, et cetera, and we'll argue and somehow or another evolve to get legislation related to these programs. This is what the idea was, but I looked at it, it's gonna be a long time, et cetera. But anyway, breakfast programs spread like wildfire. Um, it got to a point, it's got to a point where J. Edgar Hoover attacks our breakfast program. The Black Panthers Breakfast for Children program is a threat to the internal security of America. Feeding kids was a threat to the journey. That gave the Black Panther Party, I mean, uh, 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 just a whole new thing. Watch, watch yourself. Okay. That, 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 that. So my, my idea is, was politically, we got to do this. In effect, we, we actually won out with that program because the little young black politicians and the other Chicano politicians and the few liberals that got elected, when J. Edgar Hoover did that, they turned around and put a bill in for $5 million a year for the state of California for all schools for free lunch and free breakfast. I mean, literally, a Senator Ronnie Reagan, he vetoes four million of it. They run it back to the state Senate and back to the assembly and they voted three quarters of their grant and put the whole damn five million in. Overrode him, overrode his veto, okay? 28 state legislative bodies across the country, especially those that had Peace and Freedom Party frameworks in them, did the same thing over the next year and a half, similar about free breakfast. So my concept of evolving socialism was to evolve programs, community control programs, grassroots programs, finance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the people run them. That 
people's empowerment <laughs> level and making laws, etc. That, that, that do it. So when, by the time Bernie Sanders hit, I loved it. I just loved it because the guy, I, I, I love him outlining the program. Now he wasn't all that perfect and all that stuff, but my point is I can make an argument for that. And it was the programs that he was putting around, right on down to how they was gonna get paid for hedge funds, whatever, et cetera. That, to me, is the process of evolving that kind of revolutionary social revolution. Re so revolution to me is re-evolving more political, economic, and social justice empowerment back into the hands of the masses of the people on the community control level. That's my concept or model idea of what socialism ought to be, or could be, or should be. All right, now we're gonna open it up uh, for questions from the audience. What I'm gonna do, uh, just so we can get through as many people as possible, but still have uh, a higher chance of your question getting answered, I'm gonna take three at a time. Um, we have a lot of people in here tonight, and I wanna get to everyone, so just gonna ask for people to raise their hands and then I'm gonna point to three people and we're gonna give you the mic. Try to keep it to like a minute to two minutes if possible so we can get to as many people um, as we can. Uh, so we'll hopefully do like a few rounds of three. So go ahead and raise your hands if you have a question. Okay, we have one right there and we have one right here. Just two? Oh, three? Okay, there we go. All right, so go ahead and pass the mic off. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, Bobby, uh, even though you, the party created, you created a lot of great programs, like the uh, free breakfast program and health clinics and all kinds of things, and you educated a whole lot of people, even though you did so much good for a lot of people, thanks to the media and J. Edgar Hoover, uh, they remember the party members as carrying guns in public. And a lot of people don't, a lot of people didn't realize that it was legal for you to do that. And uh, uh, anyway, maybe say something about that, but also J. Edgar Hoover, they did, I guess they referred to called you a terrorist group, and uh, um, they, uh, and he created uh, Co COINTELPRO to crush the party. Maybe you could say something about COINTELPRO also. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Who put it here? Oh, you're going to ask three questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. If our present moment is at least to some extent, the product of the failure of the 60s generation. What particular aspects of the new left's political legacy um, pose an obstacle to building a left today? Yeah, um, as, as to the question of, what, of whether or not there's revolutionary possibility then or, or now, leave, leave it now aside from um, in terms of revolutionary possibilities in the past in the United States. It, is there ever going to be any revolutionary possibility in the United States as long as United States imperialism can, can continue to suck the rich resources, wealth of the world? That's three. Who would like to go first? Field. Any of them. You can take any of them. Let me pass them on. Uh, my, 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 uh, yes, it's, it's a possibility, but it takes getting a lot of people to do a lot of work. You see, this is what I did with the Black Panther Party. Get a lot of people. I mean, as I said, in seven month period from the time Dr. King was killed, my organization rose a bit. At, at that time, and this was 1968, and it was dynamic, and it happened. I mean, while people ran around and rioted, that was one thing. You said that's the reaction of the people in the streets and stuff. But me, I didn't care nothing about no riots. I didn't like riots. In fact, uh, what was it? Five days after Dr. King was killed, a riot broke out in North Richmond, California. And of course, that was the same community I had set that tutorial program up three, four years earlier. And I went out there, you know what I mean? And I heard 
there were racists standing in pickup trucks at some of the other entrance areas, you know what I mean? And, and I said, whoa, we went back, we got our guns and stuff because these racists were sitting in pickup trucks with shotguns and stuff that if some blacks came up that way, they, they was probably going to run. So we, we did. Anyway, I stopped that ride. I literally stopped the goddamn ride, you know what I mean? And then because I hadn't showed up in court one day because of all the, all the stuff behind Martin Luther King, and there, there I was in court, and the judge was talking about, you know, taking me off probation, put me in jail. So Charles R. Gary, our lawyer, he was our chief counsel out of San Francisco. He's an Armenian guy, you know, you don't know this history, but he, he's, and, and we were considering that, and he says, Your Honor, can I approach the bench? He went up and approached the bench and gave him the newspaper. Right on the front of the newspaper, Bobby Seale stops right in Richmond, California. I didn't believe in that stuff. You see what I mean? I know why it happened. You know what I mean? Etc. And the reaction of the people. Etc. Boom, 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 boom. My other day, I want to organize five thousand people. You see what I mean? That's where I was coming from, politically, to take over political seats. That was the name of the game. And I believe, I believe that that if you get more and more people really truly involved. And this is really what happened. I started those first programs, and I went to these chapters, and I went to these branches. I told them to get me out there by getting the colleges to invite me, and I would spend a second day with them to start their chapter, etc. And I taught them the fine particulars and the methodology of effective grassroots community organizing for political land the foundation to involve political electoral empowerment. I mean, we need those, we need to be able to manage the, the, those monies, you know, those funds. And to me, if we could get that going, it, it becomes a movement concept, you see what I mean? So it's no different for me today. I work with all the nonprofits over in Oakland here, okay? And we're all dealing with this building pro programs, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. And the, 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 what's the, the mayor over there, you know, they're blocking, or want to block us 16, 17 nonprofits who got building programs, you see what I mean? And I, I work with three different programs and I'm supporting candidates over there, you see what I mean? It's it. What some people have, to me, I think have uh, idealistic notions of what socialism ultimately is. I have the need to, to, to start the people off on a grassroots level. Now, a breakfast program is not an establishment of socialism, but it's a socialist kind of program, but it's only one program. And then people say, well, that's just a reform. So it's a reform. And if we get more and more political power and political control, we can establish it, just like Bernie Sanders was talking about, we make amendments to the whole goddamn constitution, you know what I mean? And make it illegal to perpetuate exploitation, et cetera, and allow corporate money rich frameworks, et cetera, to control our political institutions. So I, I'm gonna sort of respond to the question of imperialism and also the what I think the obstacles are that were sort of inherited from the 60s. Uh, I think the question of imperialism is sort of Interesting, but I'm not sure at the present moment there there could be any sort of politics based on that. So, in the sense that you don't have a party, you don't have any sort of organization that could potentially take a politics around whatever they they decided the the relation of the U.S. imperialism to the U.S. revolution. That even leaves aside the question of whether imperialism is the right category. I mean, the U.S. today has very different relations to the world than the British Empire did to the rest of the world. And that, I think, complicates the question, but I don't think, ultimately, I think it's irrelevant at this juncture. In the sense that you don't have the party that could make it relevant. You don't have the revolutionary forces that could have a revolutionary defeatist line. You don't have whatever sort of conclusion would come out of that discussion. As for the obstacles that I think come out of the 60s, I, I, I'm unsure of what the obstacles are, but I think one huge obstacle, huge obstacle is the 
I'm not entirely sure I, I, of the history behind this real is this discussion, but there is a way in which class becomes just one sort of subaltern, and life is all about power. Who gets hit with what? If you read the Communist Manifesto, it is not about power relations. It is not about poor oppressed workers taking back what's theirs. It's about capitalism's inexorable dynamic. Workers are special because they are the ones who produce. And it's not individual workers. It's being a worker in the sense that one is a worker when you work. Workers are also capitalists. They're capitalists over their own labor power. Class is not an identity. And this is very basic Marxism. It's also shocking, I think, to some people in the audience to hear this because it's not relevant. And what you see is it's the constitution of capital. This, to Marx, is the fundamental bit of our society. It is the fundamental thing that can be changed, that changing society would mean changing that relation. And I think today we tend to imagine we don't really have an idea that there are relations which are the cruxes of society. I, I often you hear this question of race or class, and that thinking is, I, mean, I recommend this Adolf Reed article. I would also recommend, if you're reading Fanon, don't read Wretched of the Earth. Read Black Skin's White Masks. And you're going to be shocked by what he says because it's going to reveal a very different imagination of what politics around race could have looked like. A very different idea of what, where that would end, and it's a very different because it recognizes there are limitations to a imagination of society that's fundamentally racialized. We live I, in a society that's still racist, but in a very different way. There are no more Bull Connors. <laughs> All right, I'll try to tackle the legacy uh, from the 60s. Let me, let me say it, um, it's too diffuse to just talk about the 60s movement since they, they included every ideological tendency. Um, there were ones that believed in a pure class. There were ones who didn't think class mattered at all. Were, you know, so I'm, I want to just talk about the section of the 60s movement that turned to Marxism or Marxism-Leninism and identified with the third world movements in particular, and what we brought that was positive and what I think was negative. So real quick, uh, I think we understood a positive was that we understood in US history that the movements for democratic rights and equality that came out of particularly oppressed communities, whether they were oppressed along racial lines, national lines, gender lines, sexuality lines, expanded democracy for all. So the black freedom movement in the 1960s opened the gates for the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, and was the power punch behind the anti-war movement. Uh, or just as we see today that the trans movement, the movement of gay and lesbian people, is opening up a different conception of gender and free is advancing things for the whole society. That was a strength. And I think it's useful to go back to that strength at a time when there's an attack on identity politics, not in the way that it's discussed here on the left, but from the right, accusing any movement uh, pushing for equality for African Americans or immigrants or undocumented people, that's dismissed as identity politics. The second thing relates to what the other point about internationalism. The people who turned to Marxism at that period of time, internationalism was, we were, we were brought up in the anti-Vietnam War. We opposed the dictatorships in Chile, the Philippines, the, drove the anti-apartheid movement, later Central America. I mean, internationalism was part of that. On the negative side, we were ideologically dogmatic. No question about it. The Stalinism thing, all of that, that was really negative. And we spent a lot of time just studying other countries' revolutions and not enough studying US history, which was a big mistake. I mean, you had a lot of people coming in that movement who knew more about the details of what the Bolshevik Central Committee discussed in 1917 than they knew anything that happened in the US history. Um, 
The second thing was because things had happened so dramatically in the 60s, even the people who turned toward a more materialist view thought if you just had the right ideas and you worked hard enough, revolution would come. And that was a terrible mistake. And it led to a lot of blame the people kind of thinking. It led to blame the cadre, because if your group has the correct line and you're not getting thousands of people, well, it means people aren't working hard enough or something's wrong with your members. That kind of stuff was terrible. So that has to be dispensed with. The last thing I would say, again, I mentioned this before, we missed the historical moment. And I want to just, we underestimated the resilience of capitalism and we overestimated. We thought it was simpler to turn the population of this country to the left than it turned out to be. And I think that's pretty important today because we're talking today all about revolution in this discussion, but this is not a revolutionary moment. This is a proto-fascist moment. I mean, uh, we are talking about just the last two days, there's bombs sent to all kinds of figures who are in the ruling class, and the right wing is saying it was done by the Democrats to uh, be a false flag operation. Every right wing, Rush Limbaugh, Ann Coulter, that is a blank check for any right-wing terrorist to do any act of violence, and they are gonna say the left did it to prove that they're the victims. That's what we're facing right now. We're not in an immediate revolutionary situation, and there's a long history of the left going back to Marx, Lenin, or any of the source figures, which is when you're facing that level of repression and danger, you fight for some kind of democracy and you make some broad alliances with people that you don't like and that you're gonna fight in the next round, but you stave that off. Marx fought autocracy, the whole communist movement fought fascism. Just what Bobby said, Stalin was a bad guy, but we'd be in a lot worse situation today if Hitler had won World War II. All right, thanks. I'm gonna take three more questions. Uh, we're at 7.24 right now and we need to be out uh, in about 10 to 15 minutes, I believe. We have some wiggle room, but let's try to keep it to that. So we have one over here, one back there, one right there. Excellent, all right. Um, so I, I come from conservation um, and endangered species and global warming and uh, looking at climate change. And I wanted to know what any of you might think about not just looking at this country um, and the situation that's going on with, with uh, Trump and everything like that, but looking at political organization globally, um, because none of these goals can actually be reached if we don't reach carbon neutral by 2050 um, and don't stop endangered species extinction. So I wanted to know what sort of theories or what you might think about uh, political organizing globally for this. Hi there. Uh, I hope my question might be a little lighter, I suppose. Uh, I graduated uh, from UC Berkeley last year. One of the groups I was involved in was a theater group. Uh, beyond doing you know, plays, improv, short films, uh, one of our organizing principles had been about the representation of Asian Americans in the media. And I think for a lot of you know, young Asian people my age, that's like a big, it is a big social justice thing, but I also see on the left, it's often considered like social justice light. You know, it's identity politics, it plays into big, you know, studio systems. And it's not, certainly it's not life or death, or it's not material. But, you know, proponents of it, including myself, argue that it's about, you know, fighting for the confidence or the dignity of um, minorities, you know, in, in the United States. Uh, I guess I just want to wonder from like a left perspective, is there a place for, for that kind of thing where the stakes aren't material but they might be more emotional or more psychological or if it's you know, perhaps not considered terribly important? Uh, 
Hi, this is an amazing talk. So, um, I was at University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1968 also, <laughs> uh, copy editing at the Daily Cardinal. And um, I'm very interested in um, an understanding of what was happening and what was not happening at that time uh, for women and um, how that has or has not evolved to the incredible um, upsurgence of uh, women looking for political positions now in electoral politics. Um, I was involved in the um, Women Against Military Madness in um, uh, Minnesota and um, have been very interested in women telling our stories over the past uh, 20 years, but certainly the past six months, uh, and how this, this upsurgence of uh, women seeing we matter has come almost directly from the women in the movements of the 1968 saying we don't want to make coffee anymore we want to make policy so if you folks can talk about um, your sense of how uh, women being decorations and secretaries in the organizations leading up to the 60s um, towards a recognition that we're not just dealing with a military industrial complex that uh, subsumes 99%, mm, I mean a huge portion of the globe in the United States, uh, but is also a um, white misogynist supremacist organization. Uh, so yeah, we have, just to recap, we have a question centered on ecology and then two questions uh, rooted around, I guess, identity politics and that sort of thing. I want to make a brief note that we actually did have Ruth Rosen, a uh, major protagonist of the women's movement, second wave feminism, who was slated to speak and at the last minute she was unable to make it. We're very sad about that. Um, so there is there's an aporia in this panel. There is a gap clearly, um, in terms of this this moment historically that I wish would have been filled, but we did the best that we could. Um, so I'm going to let everyone speak, whoever wants to speak first. All right. So I think when we talk about women making policy and certainly a secretary rising up to make policy, there's one name that comes to mind, and that is Margaret Thatcher. I, don't, I think it's a important social gain that women have this place in society, but we shouldn't imagine that women are a homogeneous political bloc. They aren't. And if you look at women leaders, you have Rosa Luxemburg, revolutionary leader in Germany in the 1920s. You also have Indira Gandhi. I don't know how many people know about the Indira Gandhi's role in suppressing uh, the Punjabi rebellions in the 70s, but, you know, so there's certainly, a way in which a politics and there the question of women in politics specifically is a complicated one because the question of women's role in society is a leftist goal could have been a leftist goal but when it comes to to, to engagement in politics there are is not inherently lead to a progressive policy uh, the other issue i think with climate change and international goals Climate change is something that a socialist government across the world, because socialism is about world revolution, would have to deal with. But could it potentially become a revolutionary politics? Maybe. Could a crisis of climate become revolutionary? Sure. But I think we're perhaps too optimistic about particular demands. I mean, I really don't think that climate change mitigation requires socialism. I've heard words to that effect. I do not think that that is actually the case. Uh, 
Well, uh, let me tackle the representational issue first. Uh, I think the framework to look at those questions is that the road to socialism and revolution lies through complete democracy, building democracy. Marx says in the manifesto that the task of the working class is first to conquer the battle of democracy. And I think that includes representation of all peoples uh, in the media, and it includes all kinds of struggles for uh, basically democratic rights. And I think they push forward. They're, they're not a distraction from the class struggle. They create a more inclusive uh, society and working class movement. So I think it's a very important issue. And it doesn't come in a pure class form, but the struggle for democratic rights, which includes the struggle for representation, voting rights, equal access, all those kinds of things is the road, is, is, it has to be embraced. Lenin's thing about you, you're not a, you're, you have to be a tribune of the people opposing all forms of discrimination. Uh, the women's movement is, uh, in one sense, the most uh, dramatic social change in the world in the last 30, 40 years. It's a global phenomenon. It's connected to changes in the underlying social structure, birth control, and uh, the, the, the conquest of understanding human biology better in the 1950s and 60s opened the door, and it's just, and then it takes a political movement. Uh, we should uplift, uh, I think uh, Watson's absolutely right about the complications of the class issue. We should look back, it's not just the Kambahi River Collective, but the Third World Women's Alliance, which grew out of the Black Women's Caucus of SNCC, was, uh, had a framework of triple jeopardy, class, race, empire. Uh, there's a whole legacy in the women's movement, it, and it's just fantastic that women of color and working class women barged through the initial people who called the first women's march, took it over, and it gave it a tremendously much more unified character. So this, this is huge, and the Me Too movement is huge. Global warming, survival of the species, and where I think the key is on that is make the fossil fuel companies the enemy. The fossil fuel-based economy is what has, is the main, it's not the only, but it's the main driving force of global warming, and the big energy conglomerates are the most reactionary section of capital, not just about oil, but about everything else. Look at Saudi Arabia, uh, and look at uh, the United States, and the way that the oil uh, complex, oil and coal, is, the right way, not just on climate change, but especially on climate change. So I think the class approach to that, make the fossil fuel companies the enemy, which 350.org switched just in the last year from trying to sort of work with them in some way. They said, make the fossil fuel companies the enemy. That's a driving force that could do something about mitigation, solving the problem when we get enough cloud in government to be able to have some impact on policy, and also build a class movement against the most reactionary <laughs> section of capital. Yeah, when you say power to the people, we don't need to talk about power to the people with respect to women. Now, in my organization, we started out, the first year of my organization, it was never no more than 50 people in it. And my wife, uh, Artie, at the time, was a member, but she never came to the office for the meetings. Uh, Huey P. Newton's girlfriend, who I introduced him to, uh, they never came to the office. We, the new office, we were, you know, we were patrolling police or whatever. So not every day, we couldn't do that. We had jobs and stuff. My point is, these were the first women. And then Tarika, she's still today, she was the first since she came to the Black Panther Party office. I remember, all we have is what? 10, 12, 11 people in the office. You know what I mean? I'm teaching them to break down weapons and stuff, you know? I remember this sister came by on a Saturday. She come by on a Saturday, she gave us the finger and ran. <laughs> and then, I, uh, what was it? A, a, a couple of weeks later, she was across the street and she raised up behind blah, 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 and gave us a finger and ran. And so I, Saturday again, because I have PE classes on Wednesday night and Saturday. 
<laughs> so little Bobby saw us and said, I said, watch out if that sister comes. And here she comes, here she comes. And so she was coming down there, and before she could do all of that, I ran outside. I said, Sister, what are you doing there? Why do you want to be giving us the finger? We are a new organization trying to organize something here, et cetera, in our community, blah, blah, blah. She said, I don't like it. I said, why? I said, you should be some. She said, you don't allow no women in there. I was a woman joined in the office. I said, no, 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 no. You don't let people join. I said, wait a minute. I had made applications out. So you have to understand something. That was the office. But at the time that this is all going on, I'm really employed by the city government of Oakland, California, Department of Human Resources. Okay. So down two blocks down the street, I made out applications. So I said, wait a minute, sister. Gave him, gave him, gave him an application. I said, you want to join the Black Panther Party? Here's an application. I mean, I can join. I said, yes, you can join the Black Panther Party. Well, she had obviously seen us. I teach people not only PE class and stuff, but I also teach them to break down and, and put guns back together, such as the M1 carbine and the Army 45. Right and so, but if I do, I want a gun like everybody else. I said, you can have a gun. <laughs> I said, come on in. And you know, little Bobby, he's just a little hip to your sister fine as you is. You know you can join out of this. <laughs> My point, though, is this was the early days, you know. Now, that was the first year. The real thing that happened come after Martin Luther King was killed and was growing real fast, when well, I guess it's near the summer. What happens is somebody calls up, says, can, can I talk to Bobby Seal? Got on the phone. Hello, Mr. Seal? I says, yes. Oh, this is Charles Brunson. I'm head of the Sacramento chapter of the Black Panther Party. And I wonder, I says, wait a minute. We don't have a Sacramento chapter of the Black Panther Party. Well, uh, sir, I got people already. I says, well, you better get down here, I says. And you, you get down here and, and, and to Oakland here, I says, and, 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 and uh, get your PE class, et cetera, down here. And let me sh sh show me what you got. So what is it? Uh, a week later, somebody calls me up. Well, my mama wanted me to barbecue with some meat, you know, uh, you know, at home, you know. Well, and I'm only six blocks from the office. And somebody said, Chairman, you better get down here. Some guy down here marching all these people down the street. I says, what? Right in the middle of Grove Street. I said, I jumped in the old station wagon going down there. You know, I carried this big 357 Python magnet under my coat. You could see it. The threatening letters that how the Ku Klux Klan or the white Nazis is going to kill us. I'd rather be caught without it. But anyway, we, we, we had a legal claim on that. My point is, I come down the street and had to park a block away from the office. Here's this guy marching, marching in exact cadence. I mean, I've been in the military. I know what good cadence is about. You know what I mean? There are 40 women in the group and only eight men. <laughs> 40 women. And he's marching them, you know, bump. And I said, well, playing all this. So I got out of the car and started walking down the street. And I said, you Brunson, right? He says, yes, sir. He's a drill instructor. And I says, take your people down there, go to there and, and then speak down there and such and such and, and put, them, put them there, you know. So we get to the office and we're like, so the church, one of the Lutheran churches, they don't have no congregation, but we had got the guy from the church to let us use, use the church, you know. And uh, boom, and I get, and, and I got, walk up to tell him, and he's, t you know, he got his troops ready. And so I says, look, uh, you know, let your troops go. He says, no, sir, no, sir. He says, they wait for inspection, sir. They need an inspection. I told him she's gonna be inspected. I said, oh, okay, open them up, dress them up, dress the ranks up. Boom, boom, boom. Open ranks, dress right, dress, blah, 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 blah. So I went and inspected all these sisters. Now, I'm a married man, but I am not, I, I'm a young man, you know what I mean? And I'm saying that these women look so good. I had to say, damn, they were there, they were, at attention while I did the inspection, 
But I did not gawk and all that kind of crap. It's just, you know, I knew better than that, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, I've been in real in inspections in the military service and such. My point is, and I gave a PE class, whatever, et cetera. But that was the first group of women that really came in. By end of the 1968 and all that organizing, 65% of the people in the Black Panther Party were women, sisters. Sister Audra Jones, she ran the Boston, Massachusetts State Chapter of the Black Panther Party. Tupac Shakira's mother ran the Harlem office of the Black Panther Party. Uh, what's the sister's name? I forget her name. Her, 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 her aunt was with the Jimmy Carter's, the President Jimmy Carter's cabinet. Uh, uh, she, 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 she was the head female on the Chicago, Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party with, with, with Bobby Rush and, 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 and so on. And of course, Kathleen Cleaver, we made her automatically on our central committee in the leadership body, et cetera. Anyway, I got a lot more to say about the sisters because you know, I had to teach them a lot of self-defense stuff and make sure to show the head of rest and, and teach brothers because I did have one guy, he raped the sister at one time, but we dealt with that in a practical way, not a negative way. Anyway. Oh, when she ran for president, we was we was we were out there so quick. The Black Panther Party, we were out there just that quick. Barb Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who was then just in Mills College, she created a committee, the, uh, the electorism, and the Black Panther Party automatically jumped on that. You know what I mean? Because me, you know, I was always for more politicians. That was the first thing with me. And then they all came down from Mills College, and I put them to I put them in the field. Uh, working with uh, other Black Panther Party members, brothers and sisters and whoever, et cetera, was Barbara Lee. So Barbara Lee will tell you that I first got involved in politics because Bobby Seal put me out in the field canvassing and registering people to vote. I said, I did? <laughs> I forgot about that. But my point is, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, I have to give her credit. This sister is, uh, she's representative of us because she worked with the Black Panther Party. Uh, Bobby Rush was the other Black Panther who ultimately became a United States Congressman for the last 30 some odd years. And we have a few other brothers and sisters, but I didn't get that whole thing about black, more black politicians, et cetera. I was always wanting more and more sisters, right up to this day. Because when the Women's March came down here two years ago, oh, I loved that. I mean, that, 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 that was key, you know. I love to see, I want more women, grassroots women, whether you're black, white, blue, red, green, yellow, folk, but you've got to be progressive or something like this here. And boom. And so there are three. Cat uh, Brooks is running for mayor in Oakland. I'm supporting her. I go to rallies and stuff and get support of her. Uh, Desiree Brooks, <coughs> recently here, you know, they, they got mounted some three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 just to get her out of the seat the corporate money rich, you see what I mean? And we gotta keep Des Lee in there because Des Lee supports all of the 15, 20 nonprofits that's doing positive stuff in the city of Oakland and stuff like that. So we need more grassroots, progressive-minded women, you know what I mean, who understand, that's, boom, you know, my daughter is 40 years old, you know what I mean? and. Uh, I love my daughter, my daughters. I named her after me, Jane Bobby Seal. <laughs> the word Jane means I love. So when she was five years old, she would play with people. And what's your name? She says, I love Bobby Seal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Round of applause for all the panelists. Thank you so much. Round of applause for yourselves. That concludes our panel. Thank you so much for coming out.